The owners of this home, like many other citizens in this state, were concerned about their indoor radon levels and are having a radon reduction system added to their home. The buyers of this new home will not need to be concerned because their contractor is building a radon system into the home during its construction, where it will be integrated into the building, work more effectively, and cost less to operate. Hi, I'm Doug Clatter. An increasing number of home builders are installing radon control systems in their new homes. This is due to a growing number of jurisdictions that require it, as well as more home buyers becoming more health conscious and valuing the peace of mind of a safe home environment. Let's take a look at how these systems work. Since radon is a soil gas that can be drawn up through openings in the foundation or in through a crawl space, a builder can connect the vent pipe to these foundation areas and route it up and through the roof where it can safely be vented. This is a passive approach, that is a vent without a fan, which typically reduces radon levels by 50%. However, if the radon levels are too high with the passive system, the system can easily be made active by the addition of a fan, provided the builder has made allowances for its installation. And making a passive system active, either during construction or after occupation and testing will most assuredly reduce indoor radon exposures to well below EPA's action level. Let's walk through all of the steps that one successful builder is using to illustrate how an active radon system is installed during construction of a new home. Why an active system? Well, regardless if you install an active system from the get-go or you are installing a passive system with the potential of installing a fan if post-construction testing warrants it, the system still needs to be designed as though it would be active. In this case, the builder has opted to install the soil gas collector as a loop inside the footing, but separate from the water drainage system. This was done by digging a trench, laying in some clean aggregate, and laying in the corrugated and fabric-wrapped perforated pipe. Where there are other utility lines, since perforated pipe is being used for the radon system, the installer can simply drop down and back up to avoid the interference, provided adequate gravel is placed in the trench. And at a location where it will be easy to route the vent pipe up through the house, the two ends of the perforated pipe are connected to a vertical T. This allows radon to be drawn from both ends of the loop, even if a blockage should occur in the future. The T and the riser should be solid, non-perforated Schedule 40 PVC or ABS pipe. Also be sure to secure the riser to hold it vertical during the pour. Wrap the ends of the fabric cloth over the T and tape them in place to prevent concrete from getting into the pipe during the pour. It is also very important to place a temporary plastic cap on the end of the riser installed to prevent concrete and debris from entering the system till it is time to route the pipe through the house. The next step in this example was to install the rest of the subgrade systems. In this case, the interior perimeter drain, which although similar to the perforated pipe used in the radon system, the water collection system was kept separate and at a lower elevation than the radon system to prevent water from accumulating in the radon collection system. Also, to prevent an undue amount of air from being drawn from the sump, a nominal two-foot separation was maintained between the radon and the interior drain. Next, some large clean aggregate was spread on top of the radon collection pipe to ensure it was surrounded by gravel. After this, additional clean aggregate was added to ensure a nominal four inch deep gravel layer throughout the entire subgrade to allow the radon system to draw radon from beneath the entire slab. Next, a soil gas retarder was laid on top of the gravel upon which the concrete slab will be poured. In this case, the builder used a six mil poly although other builders have found that a heavier gauge poly to be more durable and have additional benefits for slab moisture control. When applying the plastic sheeting, cut the poly as close as possible around slab penetrations. Although some builders may just overlap the seams, some code jurisdictions require the seams to be sealed and the soil gas retarder membrane taped at penetrations. Next, the slab reinforcing material is applied taking care not to damage the polyethylene sheeting, which can be repaired with the appropriate tape. But this is another reason that some builders are using a more durable sheeting material. In this case, interior support posts will be set on pads, and to ensure good contact, the sheeting was cut above the pads. Pour blockouts are then placed on these pads for the concrete pour. 
After the subgrade is ready, it is time to cast the slab. Attention should be paid to the water content of the mix so as to avoid differential drying problems due to the presence of a sealed polyethylene sheet under the slab. Holes should not be poked into the membrane to help dewatering, but rather use a concrete mix appropriate for pouring on plastic. Finish the slab as you normally would, tooling in control joints, or saw cutting the control joints after the slab is set. It is also recommended that the radon vent riser be labeled to avoid confusion with other plumbing risers. Let's take a look at another approach where the builder connected to an interior drain rather than installing a separate radon gas collector. This would not be a good option if there are window well drains, area drains, or external perimeter drains also connected to the interior drain as this could cause too much excess outside air to be drawn into the radon system which could result in a loss of radon reduction effectiveness. There is an additional concern, especially when a fan is employed on the system, that if there is an interior sump, the lid must be secured at all times or a significant amount of indoor air could be lost, resulting in a significant heating penalty or backdrafting of combustion appliances. However, there can be some cost savings if an interior perimeter drain is used for both radon collection and water collection, provided things are well sealed and well labeled. In this case, as would be appropriate for water collection, a trench was dug around the interior perimeter with the pipe sloping back to the sump. Rigid drain pipe with weep holes was placed into the trench and then filled with large clean aggregate, which is appropriate for both radon and water collection. Although the radon vent pipe could have been connected to the sump lid, the builder chose to connect the radon riser on the actual drain pipe as it allowed for a more convenient routing up through the house. At the preferred location for the radon vent riser, a solid PVCT and pipe was connected to the drain pipe. In this case, you can see that they offset the riser to locate it closer to the wall. This is appropriate, provided that there are no traps placed in this offset where water could accumulate and prevent radon from being drawn from the under slab drain. The trench is then filled with clean aggregate and a filled fabric cloth placed over it to maintain good water drainage and allow movement of radon towards the drain. Aggregate is then added to bring the subgrade up to final elevation and compacted. In this case, the slab design called out for a thicker 10 mil polyethylene barrier, which in addition to being more durable and reducing moisture diffusion through the slab, it also provides a good crack bridging barrier under the slab, thus avoiding leaks should the slab crack in the future. Similar to our previous example, the plastic was tightly fit and sealed around plumbing penetrations, including the sump, and all seams sealed with the manufacturer's recommended tape. The design for this slab also called out expansion joints at the perimeter edges of the slab. Consequently, the contractor extended the edges of the polyethylene up the wall and secured it in place by nailing the expansion board against it. After the barrier was completed, the slab was cast and finished as normal. At this point, other than caulking the slab after it is cured, this is how a radon collection system is installed under a slab foundation. The same approach would be used regardless if it is a slab on grade or a basement foundation. In the case of crawl space foundations, the approach is very similar in that a length or loop of perforated pipe is placed on the earthen floor and a polyethylene sheet is laid over the top of it. Since crawl spaces are often accessed for maintenance work or even used as bonus storage areas, or where low boy furnaces are placed, a more durable high density polyethylene sheet is preferred. The seams are sealed with tape or polyurethane caulk and all penetrations including column supports are sealed. The edges of the sheeting should be run up on the foundation wall a nominal 12 inches and then sealed to the wall. It is good practice and recommended by most manufacturers that in addition to sealing the edges to the wall, that they also be mechanically attached to the wall with metal strips called termination bars or at least shot pinned in to reduce stress on the edges as well as hold it in place until the adhesive cures. And at a location convenient for routing the vent pipe up to the building, a solid PVC or ABS riser would connect to the perforated pipe beneath the plastic sheeting. This penetration also needs to be very well sealed. After the house is framed, 
the plumber or radar mitigation subcontractor can easily connect to the slab or crawl space riser and route the radon vent pipe up to the building, concealing it in chases along with other pipes or ductwork. The fan or future fan location is to be in the attic with the discharge through the high roof of the home. The vent pipe itself should be PVC or ABS pipe with all joints solvent welded. It should not be sewer and drain or anything less than Schedule 40 in thickness, although drain waste and vent rated pipe is suitable. Although 3 inch diameter pipe could be used, 4 inch is preferred to allow for the amount of air that these systems have to handle, as well as reduce air noise within the pipe. It is also extremely important that the pipe have a positive slope back to the slab or crawl space and that no traps be created where water can accumulate and stop the systems from working. The first step in installing the radon vent system is to inspect the riser to ensure there is no concrete or other debris. If so, remove the blockage before proceeding. In this case, the installer placed a flexible coupling on the riser due to the fact that the slab was designed as a floating slab due to underlying expansive soil. And since an active system was being installed in this home, the vent pipe was most easily routed into the garage. However, this required that the portion of the pipe in the garage needed to be boxed in with drywall having a similar fire rating as the garage wall. Alternatively, and especially if a passive system is planned, the routing should be up through the interior with fire retardant foam placed at each floor and ceiling penetration. But regardless of how the pipe is routed, it should be vertically supported at each floor and every eight feet of horizontal runs with a positive slope back toward the foundation riser. The pipe should also be labeled at every floor, including the attic, even if a portion may be finished over with drywall later. A radon fan is a very specialized fan that is well sealed to reduce the potential for leakage. Even so, it should be located in attic space, such that if there is a leak in the fan housing or the downstream piping, that it will not enter the living space of the home. It should also be connected to the pipe with flexible couplings to reduce vibration into the house and make it easier to replace in the future. And it's a good idea to locate the fan near an attic access to avoid the need for a catwalk to this attic located appliance. The fan must be mounted vertically to allow for interior condensation to drain down. And install a half inch varmint screen on the end of the discharge pipe and connect it to the top of the fan and push it up through the roof where the roofer can later flash around the penetration. A radon label should also be placed on the vent pipe near the fan to clearly identify it as being part of a radon system. The radon piping should also be supported both above and below the fan to allow for easy replacement of the fan without disturbing the roof flashing. The discharge with screen should terminate at least 12 inches above the surface of the high roof and at least 10 feet away from any opening in the living space of the home. In some jurisdictions, a separate circuit may be required for the radon fan. However, most radon fans for new construction use are rated less than 93 watts, and many builders are using a branch circuit such as one for the smoke detectors where an alarm would sound if the circuit power was lost. But regardless of what circuit is used, the circuit panel should be labeled to indicate what circuit is powering the radon fan. When the radon fan is turned on or a passive system is activated, a vacuum is created under the slab or the polyethylene sheeting in the crawl space that will collect radon and exhaust it outdoors. However, this same vacuum will also cause interior air to be drawn down through slab openings. There are several reasons that these openings should be sealed and it is also a requirement of Appendix F of the International Residential Code. First, sealing improves radon reduction. Sealing also reduces the loss of interior condition air which otherwise could increase building energy cost and in cases of significant leakage, combustion appliances could backdraft. But overall, sealing reduces the amount of air the radon system has to move, thereby allowing for either smaller radon fans and a much higher probability that a passive system will work without the need for a fan. Expansion joints are very large leak points and polyurethane caulk should be applied to bridge completely over the joint. First, clean the joint of debris with a brush, broom, or shop vac. Using gun grade polyurethane caulk, apply a liberal amount of caulk onto the joint. Then tool the caulk into the corner with a spatula 
or a piece of disposable cardboard ensuring that the caulk goes onto the slab and up onto the wall by at least three-eighths of an inch. In the case of a cold joint where the slab is cast tightly up against the foundation wall, the slab can still contract and present a leak point. Although some guidances do not require cold joints to be caulked, it is good practice to do so. To caulk a cold joint, you should also brush away loose debris and dirt. Then apply a full bead of polyurethane caulk along the joint. Tool the caulk into the joint, pushing it into the corner, ensuring that the crack is well covered. Since control joints are locations where the slab is engineered to crack, most guidances recommend that tooled or saw cut control joints also be caulked. As far as hairline cracks that may occur, it is felt that the polyethylene sheet beneath the slab, especially when a more durable 10 mil sheet is used, that it will bridge under these future cracks, thus eliminating the need to grind out and caulk small stress cracks. To caulk a control joint, remove debris from the bottom of the joint. If it is a narrow saw cut joint, a shop vacuum will need to be used. Although flowable caulk can be used if the joint is not already cracked, it is typically more convenient to use the same gun grade polyurethane caulk as you used on the Florida wall joints. Apply the caulk into the joint but not above the top of concrete and tool it with a very small putty or cake decorating knife. All plumbing penetration should be caulked around including the radon vent riser as well as sewer lines and toilet flanges. If there is an expansive material around the pipe, it should be cut down and then caulked over and tooled up onto the pipe and onto the floor. And floor openings such as blockouts for support columns should be filled with non-shrink grout. Blockouts under tubs or showers should also be filled and grouted and plumbing blockouts for future fixtures should be fitted with plastic tubs and caulked or fill the entire blockout with a thin two inch layer of grout that can easily be busted out when the new fixture is added. Penetrations through foundation walls, such as for water supplies, lines should also be caulked. If the radon system is connected to the water drainage system, or even if you're not connected to the drain and there is a sump inside the house, the sump needs to be sealed. This should be done with a bolted lid with a gasket between the lid and the crock to allow for future access to the sump pump. Penetrations through the lid should also be sealed with gaskets or rubber grommets. If the lid has to be sealed, use a less permanent caulk like silicone rather than polyurethane. Besides under slab drains, a number of other drains can enter a sump. And because the sump is directly connected to the soil, these drain lines can cause the loss of interior air if the system is active or render a passive system ineffective. Examples of drains that can enter a sump are floor drains, condensate drains from an air conditioning system, and drain legs from collection pans under water heaters. If these drains go into the sump, they should be fitted with a water trap or routed to a floor drain dependent upon local code restrictions that has at least a six inch deep water trap. Now that the system has been mechanically installed from basement to roof, it is time to add the finishing touches that help the home buyer or future home buyer understand how the system works and how to maintain it. This would include labeling the pipe at each floor and also in the attic. It would also include labeling the sump lid, advising the homeowner that the lid should be kept in place other than when the sump pump needs serviced. In which case, if there is an active fan that it be turned off and after the service is completed that the lid be replaced and the fan turned back on. If there is a crawl space, a label should also be placed on the membrane near the access hatch indicating that the sheeting is part of a radon system and that it should not be removed or damaged and if the membrane is damaged, how it can be repaired. There should also be a system label that states that a radon system exists in the home providing contact information of the installer. In the case of a passive system, there should also be a recommendation to test the home to determine the need to add a fan, and if it's an active system, an indication of the breaker the fan is powered from, and how to interpret the performance indicator that would have been installed at the same time the fan was installed. A performance indicator is a device that is installed when a fan is incorporated into a radon system. Commonly, it is a U-tube gauge that measures the vacuum in the suction piping and if the vacuum should change significantly from the vacuum that was noted when the system was installed, the fan could have failed. 
or the pipe could be plugged or even broken and the homeowner should call for service. The indicator itself should be located in a place where the homeowner can occasionally view it. If the vent pipe is exposed, it can be located directly on the radon vent pipe itself. However, if the pipe is totally enclosed, then an inexpensive quarter-inch tube can be connected to the pipe and routed through the ceiling to a location such as a utility room where both the U-tube and the system label can be located. To install the U-tube, remove the plugs from each of the two ends of the U-tube that held the special gauge oil in during shipment. Remove the adhesive strip on the back of the measurement scale and press it firmly onto the pipe or board. Place the U-tube vertically, being careful not to spill any of the gauge oil. Slide the U-tube up or down until the top of both liquid levels are at zero. Then secure the U-tube with the screw so it will no longer slide up or down. Next, drill a small hole into the pipe to one side of the U-tube and about two to three inches below its top. Connect the small piece of tubing that is provided with the U-tube to one side of the U-tube and insert the other end about a half inch into the radon vent pipe. It does not make any difference what side of the U-tube that you connect the tubing to. With the radon fan operating, you will see that the liquid levels on each side have changed, indicating there is a vacuum inside the pipe. It is not critical as to what the actual vacuum is, but rather if there are changes in the future. So if the radon system is completely installed and all sealing has been performed, the vacuum you read is now the benchmark going forward. Mark the YouTube reading with a label or an indelible marker for the homeowner to easily notice changes in the mechanical performance of the system. Apply some silicone caulk on the tubing to secure it in place. It is also a good idea to write the system vacuum on your main system label as well as in your records for future reference. Lastly, it is important to understand and to convey to the homeowner that this device does not measure radon, but rather measures the vacuum within the radon system in units of inches of water column. As far as actual radon measurements, the only way to know what the radon levels are is to conduct a radon test after the home is fully constructed and when the building's heating and ventilating equipment is operating as normal. This could be performed right before closing or shortly after the buyer takes possession. To conduct a short-term radon test, all exterior doors and windows should be closed for 12 hours prior to and all during the minimum two-day test. And if there is a radon fan, it should have been operating for at least 24 hours before the start of the test. Although workmen can go in and out of the house during the test, they should not leave doors and windows open as might happen when final touch-up painting or cleaning is done. It is also a good idea to post signs on all entry doors and in multiple languages to avoid a test being invalidated. And you may also want to schedule the test over a weekend when there is less activity and therefore easier to maintain closed building conditions. In accordance with EPA protocols for real estate testing, the test device or devices are typically placed on the lowest habitable portion of the house. If the lower level is unfinished, the test device can be placed on a stand or fastened to an interior stud. It is also very important that during this test that the devices not be disturbed or the test could be invalidated. So the overall approach as outlined in Appendix F of the International Residential Code is to install a passive system complete construction, and have the home tested by a certified radon professional. If the radon levels are elevated and there are no problems with the system, install a radon fan and retest the property again. And even if you decide to install a fully active system from the beginning, the home should still be tested to verify low radon exposures. Radon systems, once properly installed, inspected, and tested can operate for many years with essentially no maintenance. However, things can fail or be damaged, and you should recommend that the homeowner retest their home at least once every two years. Some builders also provide or recommend long-term radon measurement devices that can be placed in the home for several months as an additional confirmation and evidence of compliance within the normal 12-month new home warranty period. So we trust that this overview can help you and your subcontractors install a quality radon system that provides an additional value-added feature for your home. Of course, every home is a little different, and local building practice can vary that require each system to be specifically designed. 
If you would like to learn more about the design of radon systems or become certified in radon measurement or mitigation, be sure to follow some of the links or download the resources available on this webpage. But most importantly, on behalf of our sponsors, we thank you for your interest in this important subject and wish you the very best in building quality and safe homes for our future.